Life often feels like a series of problems, one after another. Hearts get broken, dreams get broken, lives get broken. But what if all along, God has been leading you to a place of joy in all the setbacks of your life? We can take comfort in this message. No matter what, God can bring restoration out of the brokenness in our life. No matter what setbacks you've been facing, God is using those trials to connect you to something far greater than yourself. As you stay faithful in the middle of your shattered dreams, watch God bring about His perfect plan to display His power, give meaning to your pain, and bring restoration to your life in every step. Well, the new year is still pretty young. We're uh, into it. It's only eight days old. And I just want to do a progress report and see how's, how's, how's it going. Good? Bad? Somewhere in between? Pretty much the same as 2022? Um, I'll give you an update on mine. Yesterday, I, I went to the hospital to visit a gentleman who's my age, and he is dying. He's on a ventilator, and his 20-year-old son has to make the decision when to pull the plug. And it was hard to see. It was just, uh, it was overwhelming, obviously, for the young man. This is his dad, his mentor, his friend. Uh, the one who's been there all these years to give him wisdom, knowledge, encouragement to provide for him. And all of a sudden, he's about to enter into this whole new world where he doesn't have that, that partner with him. Uh, but now he has to figure out, how do I provide for myself? And some of you right now listening may know exactly what he's going through. Where you've experienced a loss of someone who's very near and dear to you. Um, maybe they were your provider, and, and now that's not there. Or maybe uh, you're experiencing loss in the sense that a, a job that felt secure is no longer there, it's taken away, and, and you don't know what to do next. Because inflation has not gone away, gas prices are still high, uh, eggs are extraordinarily expensive, milk is crazy, right? And, and whatever you're making doesn't seem like you can make ends meet. School bills, hospital bills, just putting food on the table. If that's your situation, I'm so thankful to God that you're here with us today because I know that the Lord has a word for you. And I also know that there's some of you that you're okay. In fact, maybe you're better than okay. That your salary, your, your hourly wage has kept up with inflation, uh, the gas prices and the eggs and the milk. Um, yes, it's, it's annoying, but... It's not a problem. You can take care of all that. And you're in a situation where maybe now, more than ever, you're, you're, you're financially stable. And I want you to know that the Lord has a word for you today as well. And both words are going to be found for us in, in our lesson of Ruth chapter 2. And last week, we were introduced to this book. And in Ruth chapter 1, we got to meet Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, who was a woman who knew tragedy and trauma. In fact, she and her husband, they were from the little town of Bethlehem. They had two little boys, and they were living during a time of famine. And so to take care of their family, they, they made the hard decision and picked up and moved to Moab, which is about 50 miles away. But while they were there, Naomi's husband died, leaving her a widow. Her sons eventually grew up and married, but they too died, leaving her a grieving mother. And, and this was a lot for her to take. Um, in fact, she wanted to change her name to Mara. Uh, anyone remember what that means? Bitter. Like, Don't call me pleasant anymore. Don't call me Naomi. Call me bitter. Um, she was really struggling because she, she was blaming God for her, her situation. She felt like God had abandoned her when she needed him the most. And so now she's left with just one of her daughter-in-laws, Ruth, um, and Ruth says, I'm going to go where you go. I'm going to stay where you stay. Your God will be my God. She's, she's a great woman of faith. And she says, I want to go with you. And what happens is we find out that the Lord has now taken away the famine from Bethlehem. The, the crops are starting to grow. And the ladies decide, well, let's go back there. 
Um, Naomi is still wrestling with her bitterness, uh, but she has Naomi or Ruth as her wingman. And, and so what I'd like to do is share with you the entirety of Ruth chapter 2 at this time. It's printed out in your bulletins. And it's also in your Bible there, obviously, and, and, and Ruth 2, if you'd like to follow along. It's not going to be on the screen. Um, but listen to what God's Word has to say. <clears throat> Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseers of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, she's the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women and work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I've told the men not to lay a hand on you and whoever you are, whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here. Have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men. Let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stocks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until the evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, That man is our close relative. He's one of our guardian redeemers. Then Ruth and Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until until they finish harvesting all of my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him because in someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvest were finished and she lived with her mother-in-law. This is God's word. So in chapter one, we learn that Ruth was a woman of great faith. Even after the death of her husband, she continued to have uh, hope in the Lord, and she made the conscious decision to go with Naomi back to Bethlehem, a foreign land where she would be considered a foreigner. You think about that uh, personally. I've I've traveled. Anyone here traveled before? You go out of the country, experience that. Okay, um, it's it's fun. It's exciting to to see new cultures. But um, when I've lived out of the country, I, I ran into situations where people discriminated against me. They took advantage of me. Uh, some of them treated me as if I were subhuman, unfortunately. Um, it, it can be dangerous traveling to another country, especially if you're a woman. But Ruth went to Bethlehem with Naomi. She arrived there, and and she wasn't just sitting around twiddling her thumbs. It says she went right to work, and she went into the fields to glean. Now, what is gleaning? Gleaning is one of God's Old Testament uh, welfare programs. 
And it's recorded for us in Leviticus chapter 19. Take a look at the screen here. It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. So God tells the landowners, the farmers, that when you go over your field, don't go over it and over it and over it. Um, I grew up in Nebraska working in cornfields, and what we did was we didn't pick corn, we detasseled corn. Do you know what that is? So it looks like the tassel that you have on your hat when you graduate, but it's in the corn. And you have to stick your thumb in there and pop it out. And, and the reason for this, and I'll get all technical on you, is, is that they, they don't want cross-pollination. They're, they're making specific corn. And so you have to go through and pull it out. Well, what do they do is they make us go th back through because us young teenagers are talking the whole time, so we miss a ton of them, and so we got to go back through it. So he's saying, go through your field once and leave it for the poor and the foreigners so that they can come through and eat. And, and what's beautiful about this is that God is challenging those who are rich to be generous with the gifts that he had given them. And then he was giving those who were in need the opportunity to work for their food and have dignity. This is something that they could be proud of. Well, Ruth was a person in need. She was a poor foreigner. And, and notice that even though she had great faith in the Lord, she, she didn't sit around waiting for a miracle to happen. She didn't think, well, God brought manna down from heaven and he sent quail to the Israelites back in the desert. He should do the same for me. No, she got up and she used her God-given abilities, talents, and strength and she took advantage of the opportunities given to her. And what this shows us is that God, yes, he can do miracles. Yes, he can provide food in an instant. But more often than not, he doesn't work through the supernatural. What God does is he works through the natural. And when we find ourselves in need, we get to say, Lord, what are my strengths? What are my talents? What are the opportunities that are afforded to me? And again, we're told that Ruth took full advantage of those opportunities so that she could take care of herself and Naomi. And, and Ruth is a great example for us. She reminds us that when we fall on hard times, there is no shame in taking advantage of programs that are, are designed to help people in need. And there is no shame in doing quote unquote menial work to put food on the table. You right now may not have a glorious job. Uh, you may not have a fancy title or uh, you know, cool letters before your name. But it doesn't matter as long as you're doing it for the Lord, as, as long as you're working for the Lord. And the Apostle Paul writes about that to the Christians living in Corinth, specifically the poorest amongst them. And this is what he says in Colossians chapter three. He says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor. Have you ever done that before? Like the boss isn't around, you're just, just and then all of a sudden like, the boss is coming. And then you're like really hurrying up. He says, don't do that. He says, work faithfully even when the, the boss isn't around, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And then he goes on. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Poor Ruth was serving the Lord even though she was working in the fields of Boaz. And her hard work did not go unnoticed and it did not go unrewarded. Boaz had heard about how Ruth was working to provide for herself and for her mother-in-law, Naomi. The, the other servants said that she'd been working all morning. She had only taken one break, but she, she was a go-getter. She wasn't just looking for a handout or a free check in the mail. And then so Boaz notices this, he recognizes it, and he rewards her further for it. He invites her to work in his fields. Under his protection, he told all of his servants, make sure nobody touches her. You need to protect her. He said that she could drink from the, the, the jars that the men provided full of water. Back then, they didn't have sinks and running water. They had to go to the well and, and get it out. He said, it's already provided. You drink that. And it says that he even gave her the privilege to glean among the sheaves. What that means is, and, and you may have noticed, he said, and go ahead and take some out. 
so that she can pick it up. So that meant that every day, no matter what, Ruth would go home with something in her hands that there was, she was always going to be provided for. And so she goes back to work after hearing all these blessings from Boaz, and it says that she gathered up an ephah, which would have lasted her and, and, and Naomi at least 10 days worth of food. Again, this all happened because of God's provision. God provided for his servant Ruth through her hard work and, and through the opportunities afforded to her through God's servant Boaz. And Boaz was a godly man. Do you recognize when, when he entered into the field what he said? The Lord bless you. And they all said, and the Lord be with you. And you're like, that kind of sounds familiar, right? Sometimes we have that call and response up on the screen. I'll say something, you say it back to me. But they weren't in church, were they? He was out in the field. And what's awesome about this is that Boaz brought his faith with him to work. His faith in the Lord is what guided him and motivated him to treat Ruth, this poor foreigner, with dignity and respect and love. His conversation, if, if you heard that, was it was full of blessing and it put her at ease. Think about the dynamic here. Boaz was a rich landowner. Ruth was a poor widow from out of town. And yet he didn't discriminate against her. He didn't belittle her. He didn't make her feel less than. Why? Because no one should be meant to feel that way. In our Declaration of Independence, it says this. Take a look. It says, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So this is in our government document, right? And so they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, meaning all people, are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, rights that cannot be taken away or given away. Do you know where this concept comes from? The Bible. It comes straight from the word of God. It comes from the book of Genesis where it says that God in the beginning made the male and female in God's image. Boaz knew that. Boaz looked at Ruth as an individual who was made in the image of God. Didn't matter her status, didn't matter if she had a lot of money or not, didn't matter if she was a full-time worker or a part-time worker or a poor person coming along, picking up and gleaning. He dealt with her with dignity and respect. And the reason that it's important to, to bring this up and talk about this is because all of us, in some way or another, have been conditioned to believe that some people are better than others and some people are more worthy than others. I used to naively think that racism was only an American problem. And then I traveled. And then I found out, no. <laughs> Everybody can be infected with, with racism and classism and people are discriminated against by their, their skin tone, their accent, where, what neighborhood they live in, their zip code, uh, how much money they make or don't make, where, where they live, what, what they buy, what they wear, uh, what car they drive. And why is that? Because it is so easy for all of us to forget this basic truth that God has made all people in his image. Boaz did not forgive that forget that. He, he believed that with all of his heart. He believed that all people matter because God says they matter. And what you need to know and understand and believe is that you also were made in the image of God. And more than that, you have been redeemed by the, the invisible, the, the image of the invisible God who we know as Jesus Christ is that this image in us has been marred and stained because of sin. But Jesus Christ gave up his life. He paid for you to make that image pure, holy, and perfect once again. So it doesn't matter if you're a doctor working in a hospital, hospital or a, a, a janitor working in a grade school. God declares that you are somebody, that you are worthy of his love. And also, everyone you interact with is somebody and worthy of God's love. I've been reading through this book uh, about the Hmong people. 
and it's a history of their time in Vietnam. And, and the, the reality is the Hmong don't have a country of their own. They've been nomads for centuries. During the Vietnam War, they uh, allied themselves with the Americans. But when the Americans left, they went into hiding in the jungles to survive, to hide from the Viet Cong. And, and some of the stories that I read are just horrible. Well, many of them uh, went into Thailand to find safety. And one of the stories talks about how they, they'd been in the jungle for so long, they were emaciated, they were starving to death. I mean, they were literally skin and bones. And, and one of these small little women had given birth and barely had any clothes on. And she's walking through the center of the city. And in it, it says that she wished that the people would have recognized that she and her newborn baby were human beings. Because the way that the people stared at her as if they were these stray dogs that were flea-ridden. And it broke her heart, and, and I hope it breaks your heart to think that some people are viewed that way. Or that we allow ourselves to view people that way. See, one of the main reasons basic human needs aren't being met in our world today and in our, our personal neighborhoods is be, because we forget this basic, simple truth that everyone is made in the image of God. And everyone needs to have that image restored by their Savior, Jesus Christ. Right now, some of you can relate to Boaz. God has richly blessed you spiritually. He has blessed you financially with, with property. He's, he's given you so much, ultimately, so that you can be the answer to someone's prayer who is in need, so that you can show them honor, dignity, and love. But in order to carry that out, in order to, to do that important task, you need to know that it's okay to take your faith with you wherever you go. It's okay to take what you learn here in, in the confines of this church building or, or as you're listening online or as you do your personal Bible study that it's okay to be bold and it's okay to go up to people and say, the Lord bless you and the, the peace of the Lord be with you and, and not be ashamed of that but to let that exude out of you, to treat everyone you encounter no matter who they are, the way you want to be treated. But more importantly, to treat everyone that you encounter the way that Jesus Christ has treated you. You think about it, Jesus was the most popular, most famous person of his day. And yet everybody had access to him. Even the little children. His, his, his entourage tried to shield him from certain people and, and what would Jesus say? Come to me. Let them come. He, he wouldn't discriminate. He, he would hang out with the rich and the poor. The lawyers and the criminals the righteous and the unrighteous. In fact, we're told that, that God sends his reign on the righteous and the unrighteous so that all people would come to know and recognize his love and ultimately have a personal relationship with him. Jesus Christ has chosen to have a personal relationship with you. He loves you. He, he accepts you, not because you're better than anyone else, but because he is generous in love. And he now gives us that generous love by the power of his Holy Spirit. And so if you identify with Boaz, if you're blessed spiritually and financially, I want to challenge you today to pray. Boldly, specifically, that the Holy Spirit would use you to bless other people. That God would help you to come up with a, a plan of provision that you would help people who are in need to find dignity and let them know that it's okay that we all go through hard times and that, yes, we still have our, our different talents and our abilities and our strengths and, and they can use those. But most importantly, as, as a Boaz, you get to encourage people that they are made in the image of God. Yes, it's true God could use miracles to provide for his people and sometimes he does. But more often than not, God uses us, his people, you and me, to provide for his people. This is how we get to enact God's provision in our lives. So no matter where you find yourself today, rich, poor, somewhere in between, I want you to know that you belong to God, you are loved by God, and you can be confident that your God will provide for you. Let's pray.
Lord, thank you for this story of Ruth and Boaz and just the, the beauty there, that the lines of poor and rich and foreigner and, and native-born are erased by your love. And God, I pray for all of us today that you would take any of that discrimination from our hearts. Forgive us for the times. Forgive me for the times that I've looked at people and sized them up and, and wondered if, I, if they were worthy of my time. God, they absolutely are because you made us worthy of your time. Thank you for sending your son to redeem us, to conform us into your image. And we pray that we would share this message with others, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. I invite you now to declare